Well, good morning, church. My name is Brixton Schmidt, and I'm one of the pastors here at BFC. And I'm Misty Jaggers. I'm on staff here at BFC, and we are thrilled that you have chosen to worship with us today. Yes, and we would love to connect with you. Whether you're a first-time guest, it's your first time being here. If you're a lifelong attender and you want to know about next steps, we'd love for you to fill out a connect card. And those are right underneath the armchairs at your seat. Uh, and we'd love for you to fill that out, drop it off at one of the connect slash give boxes in the back of the sanctuary and throughout the church. Or if you're online, you can fill out the QR code and fill it out right there. Another way to connect here at BFC is to begin to serve. And I am thrilled to share with you today about just one of many incredible opportunities to serve at BFC. Our family ministries team is committed to creating spaces where all of our kids and families can feel like they are loved and seen and cared for. We know that they have to feel like they belong here as a part of their journey to come to know and love Jesus and know and love his church. And so Candy Gustafson, our special needs coordinator, and Michelle O'Hare, our breakaway coordinator, along with an incredible team of volunteers, minister to our kids and families with special needs through our BFC Buddies program and through Breakaway. If you have a heart for individuals with special needs, we would love to get you connected with either of these ministry areas. I promise you, you will be a blessing to a child and their family if you serve in these areas, but I also promise you that you will be blessed and you will grow and feel discipled in your journey with Jesus as you love and serve others. So if you are interested in serving in either of these ministry areas, you can also in indicate that on your Connect card or you can stop by the table in the lobby and get, get more information. Absolutely, what a great way to serve and invest in ministries like this grow and expand and do awesome things for the kingdom through your generous giving. We love to be part of such a generous and awesome church in that way. And so you can give in a couple different ways. Uh, you can give through, once again, those connect boxes in the back, drop off your offering or uh, online or through the BFC app. We'd love for you to give and see what BFC is doing uh, along with the mission of God here on this earth. So with all that being said, let's continue in a posture of worship. Worship. Well, good morning. So great to see all of you here today. Would you stand to your feet and let's celebrate the hope that we find in Christ Jesus today. Let's worship him with all that we have. Pick it up.
Christ he lives and what reward will heaven bring everlasting life with him there we will rise to meet the Lord that sin and death will be When Christ is ours forevermore Oh, say hallelujah Our hope springs eternal Oh, say hallelujah Now and ever we confess The Christ, our hope and life and death Sing it again grateful today. Amen. Praise the Lord that we have that assurance in him. He is our solid rock, our firm foundation, and we worship him today with all that we have. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest grace. Until the day that trumpet sounds, we find our hope, our strength, our goodness, everything in that rock who is Christ Jesus. Psalm 18 says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. My, he is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I'm saved from my enemies. So we're going to call to the Lord, our rock, our stronghold, in just a moment. I want you to join me this morning in praying for uh, Reverend Larry Morris. Larry has been, uh, grew up very near here in Oklahoma and is a Southern Nazarene University graduate 
30 years of pastoral ministry in Oklahoma and Texas. Currently serves as the vice president of university relations for SNU, and he'll be bringing the word for us in just a few moments. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we love you. We thank you so much for these songs, these promises, your word. We can stand on it. It'll hold up. It has held up in every situation. We, we have no fear about where our hope lies. We have no fear about the sound of a trumpet someday. Lord, we look forward to the sound of a trumpet someday and being called home to be forever with you. But until that day, Lord, we've got work here on earth to do. You gave us clear instructions, and we, your church, want to be about that work. We want you to find us, not, not standing around looking into the sky, but ready and working and, and doing all that we can to gather the harvest that you will come to bring home. Lord, I thank you for our friend Larry, and I pray your blessing upon him this morning as he brings to us your word. I pray that you would bless him from from head to toe, that his lips would be anointed to preach good news to folks like us today and that our hearts would be anointed to receive it well. Thank you so much for what we see and hear in this room. And I ask your blessing on all of it in the name of your son, Jesus, who is our rock. Amen.
Well, good morning, BFC family. It's good to see you this morning. I am not Pastor Rick, but uh, I'm glad you came anyway. Well, you didn't know, really, probably. That's what it was. Uh, Pastor Rick this week has been at general board meetings with the Church of the Nazarene. We are thankful that he is on the general board and able to speak into the future of our denomination. And I am honored to be able to speak to our church family. Christy and I love our church, and we're so thankful uh, to be a part of it. Well, on December 31st, Pastor Lewis McLean preached a sermon. Do you remember what the title was? Don't raise your hand, please, right now. We don't want to embarrass Lewis, okay? <laughs> it was about detours. It was about God taking us on detours, taking us away that we didn't believe or, or understand was coming our way and how God helps us navigate detours. Well, the last time I stood on this platform, I was the district superintendent of the Oklahoma District. And today I am back at SNU as a vice president there. God took me on a detour. And on those few months, one of the things you learn about on while you're on detours with God is that you learn more about yourself, you learn more about others, and most importantly, you learn a lot about God. And you learn about who he is and how he navigates our life. And I am thankful. Don't be surprised if God doesn't take you on a detour every once in a while. But also... What I'm blessed with is that you've got a great district superintendent now with Jim Bond. He's got a great vision. He's going to lead well. And I am back at SNU, and I love it there. That is a place that fits me well, and I believe in the ministry of SNU. I believe it is one of the strongest arms of evangelism and ministry that our church has. People's lives are being transformed. Students are being influenced, and I am honored to be there. And I can't imagine SNU without BFC. What a strong partnership that we have, and I'm thankful. And I'm thankful to be able to speak this morning. All right, so when I, I grew up in Mustang, and I, when I was a junior hire, I rode the bus home from school. And one time when I was riding the bus home from school, I found myself in the back of the bus with the senior high kids. And you know what kids I'm talking about. It's the ones that aren't old enough to drive, but they really are too old to be on the bus. So I'm in the back with them, and of course, I'm the junior high kid. It gets into kind of some picking on. And so, well, they stole my house keys. Now, I'm a latchkey kid. I'm going home. I'm going to be home a couple hours by myself. So this one kid steals my house keys, and I'm like begging him to give them back to me. And then he says this, I'll give them back to you if you can quote a Bible verse. I mean, it's weird just saying it right now. What was he thinking? He said, if you quote a Bible verse, I'll give you back your keys. Well, the only Bible verse I had in my arsenal was John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus wept. <laughs> so I threw it out there. Jesus wept. And graciously, the bully gave me back my house keys. Well, until I became a Christian, I thought, you know what? I think I need to have more scriptures in my arsenal than Jesus wept. So I have some life verses. Some of those life verses, you know, you kind of go back to when life gets difficult or when you need a foundation or you need direction. You probably have some. 
One of mine is Joshua 1.9. The second one is 2 Timothy 1.7. But about three years ago, God gave me a new life verse. And I was reading John chapter 3, and I came to this portion that's about John the Baptist, and he is speaking about Jesus. And these are the words that he says to us in John 3.30. John looks at Jesus and he says, He must increase and I must decrease. Another translation says, more of him and less of me. That has become a life verse over the last three years. Jesus, I want you to increase. I want myself to be second to you. I want people to see more of you and less of me. Now, sometimes I do really well with that. Other times, not so well, because in the words of the late Toby Keith, I want to talk about me. I got stuff going on in my life, and I want to be the priority. Well, we're in the season of Lent, and in the, in the season of Lent, it's this 40 days in which we sacrifice. We give up some things. Uh, in the past, it was always for me, it was sweets, and I gave up donuts, and I dreamed about donuts. It was the weirdest thing. But I would give these up in the 40 days. We're giving these up as a reminder to us to focus in on the sacrifice of Christ. His death on the cross for our sins. It's a time to acknowledge our own sinfulness. And it's also a time in these 40 days leading up to Resurrection Sunday that we anticipate the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. So in this time of Lent, we are ultimately going to this point where it's less of us and more of Jesus. So the scripture I want to take you to today is going to connect with that thought in the Lenten season, and it's in Mark chapter 8, and Jesus is going to answer a question for us in just one sentence. He's going to answer a question in which I think is still debated today. It was debated when he said it 2,000 years ago. There are people who still question it today, even in 2024. It's a question in which everyone else has opinions about, and we need an answer, and Jesus gives it to us in Mark chapter 8. He tells us what it means to be his disciple. I mean, is, is, is being a disciple of Jesus just this life of sacrifice, or is it the opposite where it's this life of just bountiful blessings and we get whatever we need to make it through the challenges? What does it mean? to be a disciple of Jesus. So let me give you the context before we go to the scripture. Up until this point in the gospel of Mark, Jesus has been doing amazing things. He has been healing people. Blind people are able to see. Lame are able to walk. He is teaching in such a way that thousands of people are gathered around him like, we want to hear what this guy has to say. And not only that, in Mark chapter 8, the very beginning of the, of the chapter, Jesus takes a very small portion of food and he feeds over 4,000 people. So needless to say, people are experiencing this with Jesus and they're starting to think, this guy is not just a rabbi. He's more than a prophet. He could be the one that we've been waiting for. So Jesus sits down with his disciples in Mark 8, 27, and he gives them a pop quiz. And he says, hey, guys, who do people think I am? And so they kind of give out some answers. Some say, well, they think you're John the Baptist. Some say they, they believe you're Elijah, risen from the dead. And another said they just believe you're a prophet. And then he asks the question that I think all of us will eventually have to answer. He looks at them and he says, but who do you say I am? We'll all have to answer that question. Who do you say I am? And in typical fashion, Peter speaks up for the group. And he says, you are the Messiah. You're the chosen one. What, what Peter, I think, was ultimately saying is that you're the chosen one. You're the one that we've been waiting for. You are the one who's going to have the, the resources of God. You've been sent from God. You're going to collect an army, and you're going to overthrow this oppressive government of the Romans. You are the one, Jesus. When he makes that statement from this point on in the Gospel of Mark, everything changes. Jesus' focus changes. 
And so in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, let's read a few verses together. They'll be on the screen. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law, that he would be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. And as he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and he began to reprimand him for saying such things. Jesus turned around and he looked at his disciples and then he reprimanded Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view and not from God. Did you guys know we're in election season? Does that surprise you? Okay, that's about as far as I'm going to go with that comment. But every candidate needs a campaign director. Peter was Jesus' campaign director. And Peter wanted to see Jesus be this Messiah. And his expectation of the Messiah was this military leader, this one who was going to set the people free, the one that they had been praying for for generations. Peter had a plan. And then Jesus comes in and he says, the son of man is going to be beaten, betrayed. He's eventually going to die. And Peter thinks to himself, Jesus, this is not the pathway to victory. Death is not the pathway. This is not the plan for the Messiah. And then he has this gutsy move. He just reprimands Jesus. And Jesus comes back at him and it says that Jesus looked around at the disciples and like, guys, you need to hear this. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Can't you imagine the disciples later on brought that one back to Peter? Do you remember the time he called you Satan? So there's this conflict because... Peter had an expectation of how Jesus was going to act and respond and work and how the future was going to look. He had an expectation. And it just didn't sound like Jesus was going to fulfill that. You ever been down that road? Will you believe that God was going to work a certain way, do things as you had hoped, certainly hoping it wasn't suffering or challenge or difficulty, when God just didn't seem to act and respond to our situations like we wished he would. Have you been there? Peter was there, and he just couldn't get it. But here's what I, here's what I believe about Peter. I believe Peter loved Jesus. He just didn't trust his methods. I really believe that there's no question that Peter loved Jesus, but in this moment, he just didn't trust his methods. And sometimes God's purposes and directions in our life don't make sense at the moment. We have to lean in to Romans chapter 8, where Paul says, I want you to know there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. So no matter what you're facing, even though it doesn't seem to be the direction you'd hope, you have to know that God loves you. So then Jesus gets into the question. What does it mean to be his disciple? What does it mean to follow him? Still lots of confusion about that. Jesus sums it up for us in one sentence, but let's start in verse 34. He says, then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any one of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. And if you try to hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you're going to save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, 
This is what it takes. Now, here's what I, I find interesting. At the very beginning of that, he says, if anyone or if any one of you wants to be my disciple. So I, I started to investigate the word anyone. Now, I am no Greek scholar. Don't go back and look at my transcript, okay? So no Greek scholar. But I figured out what the word anyone means in Greek. Anyone. In other words, what Jesus is about to say about this cross-bearing, he's saying, this is for anyone. This is not just the call for the super saint or the pastor or the missionary or whatever. He's saying this is for anyone. This is, this is not a call that, that is just for those who show up from time to time in church or whatever. He says, if you want to be my disciple, this is what it takes. So the first thing he says is you must deny yourself. Are there any of you here that struggle to ride in the passenger seat of a car. I mean, you're just tempted to give directions to the people driving. You're using the imaginary brake on the passenger side. You're clinging hard to the window next, right? Anybody struggle with that? No, I know you don't, but that person sitting next to you does, right? They struggle with that. We want to be in charge. Well, the message takes this verse where it says, deny yourself, and this is how that paraphrase translates it. Jesus said, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. I'm tempted to say, Jesus, take the wheel, but I'm not going to do it right here. So <laughs> you see, as... as Jesus is calling us to deny ourselves. He's saying there, there's this point when you say, I, Jesus, you're in the driver's seat of my life. I'm going to let you take me where you want. You're calling the shots. And I'm going to deny my selfish self, which wants what I want, when I want it, and how I want it. I'm not just going to say, well, this is what I want, Jesus. You bless it. No, rather, I am going to deny myself of calling the shots. And you, Jesus, are in charge. Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself. Now, that word deny is the same word that is to describe Peter's denial when Jesus is on trial and people are gathered around and they're looking at Peter and saying, hey, uh, don't you know that guy? Weren't you with him? And Peter says, no, I don't know the man. I think what Jesus is saying as a disciple, he's saying to us, there should come a point when you and I decide that we're going to be a disciple of Jesus, that we will look back to the time before we knew him and say, I don't even recognize that person anymore. I don't know them because I've been so transformed by Jesus that he's calling the shots. I am denying myself and I am following his ways because that is what he has called me to do. Now, I could give you a long list of things right now to say, you know, have you given this to Jesus? Have you given that to Jesus? Are you trusting him with this? We could go through that, but here's what I know. You know, and I know what it is we need to trust him with. You know your issue better than anyone else of what you need to let Jesus take control of right now. So this next illustration, I'll start it out just in honor of Pastor Rick. I grew up in a small Oklahoma town. <laughs> just a few miles from here. I, I pastor, I've pastored in Oklahoma most of my life. I'm an Okie. If you've lived in Oklahoma for a long time, there are certain things that you and I have come to accept that for those who are outside of the state or who are coming to visit, just don't understand. Let, let me give you a few. If you're an Oki and the tornado siren goes off, that's no cause for alarm. You just go out in the backyard to look at the, for the funnel cloud, right? <laughs> it, it doesn't stir us up. If you've, if you've been an Oki for a while, you're going to know at least one couple who looked at the OU football schedule before they scheduled their wedding. I mean, it's just going to happen. 
Now, here's one that, that I, I've grown up here and never thought of it. But you and I are comfortable with the fact that there are two airports within miles of this church that are both named after men who died in a plane crash. <laughs> Doesn't bother us. As Okies, we're, we're comfortable with the fact that we could go to a convenience store, and in that convenience store, we, we could rent a DVD, we could get bait, we could get ammunition, and we could get a burrito. We're comfortable with that. Those outside of Oklahoma don't understand some of these things. I, I lead all of that with this. If you and I decide to take this call of discipleship of Jesus seriously, there are going to be a lot of people who just don't get it. To live in a society that is so self-focused, it's all about us, you do you. To live in a culture that's all about how we benefit from things. When you and I decide we're going to take the call of discipleship seriously and we're going to deny ourselves, and here in a moment he's going to say, and you're going to pick up your cross, there are just going to be people who don't understand why we've chosen to do this. Because in selfish society, it just does not make sense. So Jesus steps it up a level. He says, if anyone wants to be my disciple, you're going to have to take up your cross daily. Now, when you and I talk about bearing a cross, there's some things that come to mind. We might say, you know, I, I got a difficult job, I've got a difficult boss, I've got a health issue, I've, just got, I've got challenges going on financially, I've got a really bad mother-in-law, I live with a cat, I don't know what it might be. We say, that's my cross to bear. <laughs> When Jesus' first century audience heard Jesus say, if you're going to follow me, you've got to deny yourself. And you've got to pick up your cross. They knew what he meant. Because they had witnessed cross-bearing. It's estimated that the time that Jesus was alive, 30,000 people were crucified by the Romans. So there was probably not anyone in that circle that didn't say, I've seen that. I've watched a slave, I've watched a criminal carry this crossbeam to ultimately the place of death. I've seen them face the shame and the humiliation. I've watched how their captors had full control and they had none. They had surrendered their rights. They understood what it meant to pick up their cross and follow Jesus. It, it meant there were going to be times where there's going to be shame and humiliation and people not understanding. And it's not going to be popular. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it this way. He said, when Jesus calls a man, he bids him to come and die. He, he asks us, to pick up our cross, surrender our rights, and to follow him and let him be in charge of our life. Cross-bearing can almost seem offensive at some point. But here's what we know about the cross. For the Christian faith, some of you, you're wearing a cross today. Probably most of us have crosses in our houses. We look at the cross and it is a symbol of hope. It's a symbol that we have a God who cares about us, that he would come to this earth, he would die for our sins, that we could be free, that we could be forgiven, that we could experience the life that God wants us to experience because of the cross. That really the cross is, is not a means to death, but it's a means to the life that God would want us to have. And when Jesus says, deny yourself, let me be in charge, pick up your cross and following me, he's saying you are entering into the pathway of enjoying the life that God truly wants for you. A life that is free from the bondage of sin. A life that is free from the things that hold us back because we ultimately can live as God would want us to when we come to that point to say, I am ready to be transformed. I'll deny myself 
and pick up my cross and follow you. But to live this life, there are going to be people who don't understand. When you choose to forgive those who hurt you, when you choose to care for those who are on the margins, when you choose to show love to people that you don't think or others would think they don't deserve it, when you would choose these things, there are going to be people who don't understand and we're going to be tempted to explain ourselves. I, I was reading a prayer of St. Augustine and, and it hit me, it struck me deep. He said this, he said in a prayer, Oh Lord, deliver me from the lust of always vindicating myself. And what I heard him say was, just do the right thing. Follow the pathway of Christ and he'll take care of your reputation and he'll defend you and he'll look out for you. You can trust him. If anyone wants to be my disciple, Jesus says, you have to deny yourself. You have to pick up your cross and lastly, he says, and you follow me. Follow me is not a request in this one. It's a command. You know, often when we think about Jesus, we, we have this vision of him of being loving. He's a, he's a good shepherd. He's a great teacher. Whatever vision sometimes we have. But here's the one who just called you and I and these disciples to leave everything and follow him. He is the one that is described to us in Revelation chapter 1 as the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. The one in which all people will one day bow before him and confess him as Lord because he will come back and reign forever and ever. This is King Jesus who is asking us, commanding us to follow him. This is the one who is called and he says to pick up your cross and follow me continuously. Every day, make this the decision and the choice. Ultimately, the, the life of self-denial is the lens in which every Christ follower should look through. With the decisions we make, the way we treat people, the way we interact with our society, with the influence we've been given, all of this is what should go through the lens of self-denial that Jesus is calling his disciples to. All right, well, I have always enjoyed collecting old things. They used to be called antiques. Now they're called vintage items. I brought with me today a vintage item. It's a archaic tool of monetary exchange. This is a check. You remember these? This one has addre my address three houses ago on it. So this, this check is, well, we know how it works. You sign your name at the bottom. You give it to somebody else. You could fill it in, and they have access to your bank account and then they can put it in their bank account. Everybody's following me, right? Second service, I'll work harder on this. <laughs> so, we know the term. If you sign the check and you don't fill anything in and you hand it to somebody, what are you giving them? It's a blank check. And they just take what they want. Jesus said, if you wanna be my disciple, I need a blank check on your life. Now, some of us, when we hear that, we say, well, you know what? The truth is I don't have much in the account. And follow me here. I'm not talking about money. But some of us may say, but, you know, I just, I don't know that I've got much to offer. Whatever that might be, you look at other gifted people or wherever we want to make, I just don't know that I've got much to offer. Here's what I know about our God. Throughout Scripture, He takes small things and He does amazing things through them. He, he takes things that nobody else could imagine, that He could do impossible through. He's doing the same thing with our lives if we'll just give Him a blank check. Now, some of us, if we're 
real honest this morning, would say, well, there's too much in the account. I mean, I've got a lot to give up. I've got plans. I've got a future. I've got stuff I want to do. And ultimately, I say I've got a lot to give up. Here, here's what I would push back on that. Isn't it that everything we have his to start with? He gave it to us, right? And there's, a, there's some of us today Say, you know, everything I have to give to God is just broken. It's a mess. My past, decisions I've made, things that have happened, it's just a mess. And I'm not sure what God could do with it. We serve a God who takes the cruelty of the cross and turns it in to empty tombs. We serve a God who takes broken things and redeems them for our good and His glory. So no matter what you've gone through, no matter what you bring to the table, just say, God, here it is. I'm going to deny myself. I'm going to pick up my cross and I'm going to follow you. Here it is. Do with it whatever you wish. You see, I think the challenge with this whole discipleship thing, that the, the way Jesus is calling us, so we don't have to question it anymore. What's it really mean to be Jesus' disciple? He said it in one sentence. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. I think the hesitation that we have on this is we focus more on what we're going to lose than what we're going to gain. Peter did it. Jesus says in this statement, he says, all right, the Son of Man is going to be crucified. He's going to be killed, and he's going to rise again on the third day. Apparently, Peter did not hear that statement because he says, Jesus, this is not the way it's going to happen. I want to close with this verse. And it was written decades later from the same man who said, Jesus, this is not the way it's going to happen. I love you, but I don't trust you. These are the words that Peter writes in his letter, his first letter. So if you're suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to the God who created you for he will never fail you. What I read in this is a man who took the call to be a disciple seriously and he came to the place where not only he loved Jesus, but he trusted him. Can you say the same? What I found as a pastor is that every time I put a message together, I was preaching to myself the whole time. Here's what I find amazing about our God is that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you about some particulars about some things that you need to trust him with. He's been speaking to you about it for days, weeks, months, or years. You know it. And then the grace of God drew us to church today or online today. And what God has been speaking to you about has intersected with this moment. And he's asking us, do you love me and do you trust me? If so, follow me. May your life have Jesus increasing and us decreasing, more of him and less of us. We're gonna close with a song. I love it. We've sang it here a couple of times. It's called The Jesus Way. It's a deep call. It's a great prayer. But I feel like the Lord may wanna to speak to some of us today and just... We need to just come and say, Jesus, I don't understand what I'm going through. This is not the pathway I would have chosen. But I'm going to trust you. I love you and I trust you. I want the Jesus way. Would you stand, please? We're going to sing. I'll pray for us in just a moment. And maybe some of you, maybe some families, some couples or individuals want to just come forward at the close and say, Jesus, I'm going to trust you with this. I want to be your disciple. Let's sing and then we'll pray together.
curse me, then I will bless you. If you hurt me, I will forgive. And if you hate me, then I will love you. Cause I choose the Jesus way. And if you're helpless, I will defend you. prayer that as we leave this place, we will leave as ones who trust you, that we will deny ourselves, we will pick up our cross, and we will follow you. Thank you, Father, for this church. 